Good day class. So for today, you're going to learn two new things in process control and that is the controllers and the final control element. Now, if you recall in our previous discussion when we were discussing the control system and how it is to be represented in the form of a block diagram, these two elements of your block diagram is actually lumped as one. And that is your controller and your final control element. Basically, because your final control element receives the information from the controller on what is to be done on a particular process fluid or on a particular process variable, that way the control can be affected on the controlled variable. So for this particular set of slides, we will start with the final control element that is commonly used in the industry and that is our pneumatic control valve. So it's a valve that regulates the flow of fluid. So this flow would be either that of a hot fluid or a cold fluid depending on the objective of such process fluid. Now later on in the later in the latter part of the slide you will know the different representations or the responses of the flow of our final control element depending on the type of control in which the controller has subjected it to so we will start with our uh, controllers and our final control element now so the input to our controller which in this case we will view as a proportional controller is the error so as a review this error is actually the deviation of the sensed value of the controlled variable to or from the set point now the output on the other hand of the controller is a signal if we're talking about a pneumatic control valve the signal is in the form of an air pressure now this air pressure is the one that is fed on the diaphragm of the final control element such that the flow of fluid is being regulated now our final control element as i have mentioned would be limited only to the pneumatic control valve which either opens or closes as air pressure in the diaphragm changes the diaphragm is the thing that goes up and down in this final control element that the flow is regulated now our, our our current controllers in the industry are actually electronic and are computer based instruments and they can actually effect control remotely now the operator need not be in front of the control valve that way it can regulate the flow of fluid or of the process fluid our operator can be as far as the control room of the plant and we're in the, we're in the plant is the actual plant where the final control element is let's say a kilometer away or 500 meters away so depending so this control need not be uh, something that is very adjacent to our final control element it could be done remotely and that's really the meat of controlling because you need not be where the instrument is or where the equipment is so that you can control it it can be done remotely just like what is shown here in the beginning part of the slide so you have the plant be being very far and this is where the control is in the control room and everything is done through the use of the computer or it's the computer now that does the controlling of course on the human side making sure that everything was set properly now by the controller inside the control room that's the engineer already now as for our control valve so this is the simple illustration of a control valve it has an upper part we call the actuator and the lower part is the body of our control valve so this is the diaphragm that is being mentioned this diaphragm is connected to a plug uh, which is connected to the stem also this stem which has the plug on the end lowers up and down depending on the pressure on which the diaphragm is subjected to so this goes up and down and in that process the opening here where the fluid from this part of the process is entering and passing through is being regulated if the opening is regulated the flow of the fluid is also being regulated so a very simple way of ensuring that the process fluid flow is regulated through the use of air here 
air pressure specifically on top of the diaphragm of our control valve. Now, as to the schematic diagram of the control system for our pneumatic control valve, now let's say for example the fluid that is the cooling water that is being regulated in terms of flow by the valve is being used by a heat exchanger. So this heat exchanger is receiving hot process steam and it is desired or the objective is to lower down the temperature of this hot process steam that way when it is already dispensed from the heat exchanger or thrown into the environment it will not cause what we call as temperature pollution or if it's dispensed on another body of water that would be also in itself a form of pollution because uh, locally the portion where the hot process stream is uh, dispensed into or discharged into will be hot and as such living creatures for that particular body of water will be harmed so it is the purpose of this cooling water here to lower down the temperature of this hot process steam now how is control being or control being affected in that manner for our uh, pneumatic control valve so there's a thermocouple for example that senses the temperature here of the discharged hot process steam from the uh, heat exchanger of course its temperature is already lowered because there has been cooling water that is used to cool it here in our heat exchanger now a signal in the form of current is being uh, transported and is being received by the controller now the temperature here is not in the form of temperature when it's really in its raw state so the controller does not receive really temperature so what happens is your thermocouple sends this signal to the transducer. The transducer converts this electrical signal in the form also of current in which your controller can translate into a temperature value. So the purpose of the transducer is to convert the signal, the electrical signal in here or the mechanical signal or it could be the electrical signal depending on what particular signal it is receiving receiving this particular signal it needs to convert into something your controller can understand so the controller can only receive signals in the form of current so now your controller receives a signal from the transducer uh, in the form of current in 40 to 20 milliamperes that way your controller will know what is the sensed value of your thermocouple what the controller does is it compares it to the set value here for the outlet temperature of the fluid from your heat exchanger so based on that error again your controller sends a signal in the form of current to the converter now this converter converts this current signal into the form of air pressure your valve cannot understand signal in the form of current but it can only be uh, understand the signal in the form of air pressure because our valve is a pneumatic control valve so from current to pressure it's a physical signal now the process of converting that happens in the converter so now the signal of the controller that was converted by the co by the converter in the form of air pressure is received by your final control element which is the control valve so now the control valve will do something with the flow of the cooling water. If this is hot, then the set value, then more uh, flu cooling water will be needed. So there should be an increase in the flow rate of cooling water. If this is also uh, within too low, for example, too low for the temperature that is also, uh, shall I say, not harmful to the body of water that's going to receive it, then the cooling water will also be adjusted in that way in that case the cooling water flow will be decreased so as long as control is affected in the effluent of our heat exchanger or in the water that our heat exchanger is this is uh discharge or is, is is discharging then the entire process control system for your pneumatic control valve is working so the very heart is your controller because it's the one that decides what is to be done with the uh, flow rate of the cooling water that your control valve is allowing to flow to our heat exchanger. 
So, the controller, again, as a summary, uh, compares the error from the sense value and the set point in the form of a signal. It gives out the signal to the converter. The converter converts in the form of pressure, air pressure for our final control element, which is the control valve. Okay, so that is how the simple uh, control of your pneumatic control valve is. How does it work? Now, the control hardware for uh, this uh, temperature control for a heat exchanger constitute actually of this four. And you have seen it already in the diagram. So it has a transducer. So it converts temperature to current because what the thermocouple senses is temperature and it has to be converted into current. The controller can only understand current. The controller recorder, of course, records the current and then the converter converts the current to pressure. Your controller receives current and it's only able to send current also. Its signal is also in the form of current. Your final control element cannot understand that, so it has to be converted to pressure, air pressure, and the device that is used is the converter. Now, our final control element, the control valve, is the one that ensures that the flow of the process fluid, that is the cooling water, is adjusted depending on the degree in which the final temperature of your effluent from the heat exchanger is to be reduced or increased. Now, the ideal transfer function for our control valve, that is our pneumatic control valve specifically, resembles that of a first order system. In terms of form, it is really a first order system. Its output, you can see here the output is in terms of flow rate. The Q of S here is the flow rate of the process fluid. And the input is air pressure, and that's P of S. Now, the steady state gain of this uh, pneumatic control valve is K sub V, and its time constant is T sub V, all of which are defined in here. So for many practical systems that are present in the industry, the time constant for the control valve is numerically very small. Just like if its value is added to 1, it's just like it's not there. So it's just like your denominator is just 1. So in that case, this particular transfer function for your control valve is simplified in this form. So it's now Q of S over P of S being equal to K sub V, which is just a mere constant equal to the steady state gain of your system. That is your final control element, the control valve. And by the way, this steady state gain is also a constant of proportionality between the flow rate and the valve top pressure or the pressure in which the diaphragm of your valve is subjected to. So it's a constant of proportionality that relates flow to valve top pressure okay, or pressure in which the valve is subjected to. Now, if you're going now to connect our process to our final control element, which is the valve, if you recall, this is the transfer function of our valve, and let's say this is the transfer function of our process. In terms of form, they are similar. They differ only in the steady state gain and their time constant. So let's say we will have these two linked together because your process and that is, let's say, in this case, the heat exchanger receives the flow of the final control element or receives the flow of fluid through the use of the final control element. Your final variable here is Y and your uh, input variable here is P. The input variable here is the pressure on top of the diaphragm of your final control element and your output from your process is the fluid temperature at the outlet of your heat exchanger okay so it's a thing that we have learned that whenever block diagrams are placed one adjacent to another just like these two the overall transfer function of the two systems is just uh, arrived at using the product rule so you have to get the product of the two transfer functions 
So if you'll take the product of the two transfer function, the overall transfer function of the valve and process lumped together will now be this one. So the process, our heat exchanger in the example, and the valve lumped together will have this particular transfer function. Output is Y, input is P. Now, let's say for example, now this is the part wherein we're going to look into the different forms of the responses of the output of our heat exchanger and that is the temperature of the effluent of the heat exchanger. Let's say for example, we're going to subject our lumped system of valve and heat exchanger into one and the pressure change on top of the diaphragm of your final control element is a unit step change in P. So that would then be Y of S being equal to 1 over S being the Laplace transform of the change in P and this is the transfer function that was shown to you a while ago. Now, if this is processed using method of partial fractions, since you have two linear factors here, the response will be something like this. So we just place in here the two steady state gain values because they are constants. And this is now your actual response for a step change in the input. The response, of course, as expected, is dependent on the two time constants, that of the valve and that of the process. The formula is dependent, looking at it only, dependent on the two time constants. And of course, the degree to which the y will be getting a value, and this y, by the way, is the deviation of the steady state temperature, or rather the sense temperature of the effluent of your heat exchanger from the steady state value, uh, will be dependent on the value of the t. So depending on how long, or it's, it is depending on how long has the disturbance happened. So if you know the two time constants, all you need, all the other things that you would be needing will be the time elapsed for you to know how much has your outlet temperature of the heat exchanger deviated from the steady state value. Now, if the time constant of the valve is very, very small compared to the time constant of the process, so meaning this one is very, very small, what happens is this one will be very, very big. When you divide something by a very small value, this will be very big, right? In effect, this one will pair in comparison to this. It's just like this one is not existing because this one will be very big already. So this particular transfer function here, or rather this is already the response to a step change in the P, will be simplified in this form. So, K sub V, K sub P times 1 minus. So, since this is very, uh, you could say very small, so the value of this will be very big. So, you have only 1 minus E raised to negative T over <coughs> tau P. How is that? Now, if you look very closely, if this one is very, very small, compared to this what is left is this because anyway a very small value you subtract from something that would make it very very uh, shall I say insignificant it's just like you're not subtracting anything from this tau sub p so this will be negative tau sub p and this would be negative so the two will be positive the two being positive that would cancel the tau sub p's here and this tau sub v will cancel also with the tau sub v here. And this being negative, you have it negative here. So I just leave the thorough understanding of the derivation of the simplified form of the response to you when tau sub v is very, very small compared to tau sub p. If this particular response will be considered, it's just like class that the transfer function of your valve and process, which is the heat exchanger, lumped as one would be this. Why? Because this one and this are in here, and this one actually, this 1 minus E raised to negative T over tau P is this. Corresponds to a denominator in tau S plus 1, specifically here, equal to tau sub p s plus 1 
So, this particular transfer function, again, I will repeat, is only good when the time constant of the valve is a lot less than the time constant of the process. Then, the original transfer function is simplified in this form. The original response to a step change is simplified in this form. Okay? Now, we move on. Now, let's say, for example... For this particular system now, with this transfer function, the controller is a proportional controller. So, proportional. So, from that particular name of the controller itself, you, it means that it produces an output signal that is proportional to the error. Remember that our controller only actuates based on the pressure. So, if you're going to transfer this P sub S here on the left side, what actually you have here on the left side is P minus P sub S, okay, P over uh, P minus P sub S rather divided by the error. That is actually your transfer function for your controller. So, your K sub C is the only transfer function for your controller. And your controller is acting on the error and has a output which is equivalent to the pressure in which the diaphragm of your final control element is subjected to. I hope you're getting this. This is pressure delta P here divided by the error is the steady state gain of the controller. So the ratio of the delta P or that's the deviation of the pressure from the steady state value to that of the error is actually the transfer function of your controller a proportional controller in which the transfer function is a simple K sub C that is the steady state gain of your controller otherwise known also as the sensitivity if your controller is like this what will happen to your uh, response to your uh, type of input in the final control element which is the control valve so let's look at this so this is the one that i am saying a while ago so the transfer function is this now there is this term that is mentioned in your textbook by Kao Hanor, and i'd like to leave this to you to read that your proportional band also known as the gain is the error expressed as a percentage of the range of measured variable required to move the valve from fully closed to fully open. Now, frequently used synonym for this is the bandwidth. Okay? So, this particular discussion of the bandwidth or the proportional band is depicted actually in the form of the transfer function of the controller itself. Now, there's a sample problem for this that you can read on your textbook. I will not discuss it anymore because anyhow, it's a sample problem and it's could be readily understood so i leave it to you to study and understand okay now we go to another type of controller and that is your on off controller so we're done with proportional control so your on off controller actually is just a special type of proportional control wherein the bandwidth is approximately zero the bandwidth as described in the previous slide bandwidth being uh, synonymous to proportional band or the gain. If you're going to read later on in Kauhanor, you will see the difference between these three terms and it will be clearer in that way. So that would be your responsibility to read. But nonetheless, for an on-off control, uh, you have the bandwidth approximately having no value. The final control element here, which is your control valve, acts like a switch what is a switch it's just a simple matter of on off which is best exemplified by in the case of a thermostat which automatically switches off when the temperature is already beyond the set value that it was set to operate on so just like this one so your final control element your control valve in this case is like in this case is acting like a switch like an on and off switch. 
Now, the third type of controller is the proportional integral control. So, if you recall, if it's a simple case of proportional control, you have P of S over E of S, and that's the error, the plus transform, is equal to K sub C. What happens if this is already uh, modified into the form proportional integral control? You have to add to the proportional action term, which is K sub C times the error, another term that compensates for the integral of the error that is how will your error be if integrated so you can see here this is the integral of the error this p sub s would be transferred here and as such this is already the type of response in terms of pressure output pressure of your final control element if the controller is a proportional integral control if this is your, uh, shall I say, if this is how the transfer function is written, accompanied by, or shall I say, taking into consideration the integral of the error, or shall I say, the time integral of the error, then the transfer function of your PI control will be something like this. Remember, class, that if it's just... Uh, if it's just a case of a proportional controller, the only thing that you'll be seeing is the case of C. You don't see this. So, proportional control is just P of S over E of S being equal to K sub C. However, now, since you have already the integral, the time integral of the error being considered and it's added here, what happens is you have to consider the time integral of the error so this one is added the one over tau sub i s okay so if it's proportional control you only have k sub c if you have already integral control added to the proportional control you have this one you have added k sub c divided by tau sub i s okay so that's for the pi control what happens if you have a proportional derivative control? So it's not anymore the integral of or the time integral of the error that you are compensating, but you are compensating for the derivative of that particular error. And by the way, this time integral class, time integral, when inverse is the reset rate so the reciprocal of the integral time or time integral is the reset rate so if we go back to our slide here this is now the pd controller adds to the proportional action term another that is proportional to this time the derivative of the error not its integral but it's the derivative of the error other terms that could be associated to PD control is rate control and anticipatory control. Now, this can be used to represent this particular type of control. The effect of the derivative action is to, just like its name here, anticipatory control, is to anticipate the linear change in the error. If the PI control compensates or anticipates rather or compensates the time integral or compensates for the time integral of the er error this one anticipates the linear change in the error you have learned in your differential calculus that your derivative is actually the slope of a line so that same principle is being applied in here the derivative of the error the time derivative of the error or the derivative of the error with respect to time is being added to the proportional action term k sub c times the error the effect is it's actually antip anticipating the linear change in the error so if you could see this one if transferred here the only difference of this equation from the proportional control is this one the derivative or the time derivative of the error now if this is our resulting equation then the transfer function take note how we're talking about the transfer function not of the control valve but that of the controller the transfer function of your controller if it's a pd control is like this okay we have discussed already in the two previous slides that the 
transfer function of the final control element. In the discussion for proportional control and proportional integral and now proportional derivative control, the thing that we are considering is already the transfer function of the controller because we're done with the transfer function of our control valve. So the transfer function this time is comparable to inform with the transfer function of the PI control. The difference here, in here is you're not multiplying the S to the reciprocal of the time integral like this, but rather you're multiplying the derivative of the uh, tau constant or the time constant to S, not reciprocal, but rather the multiply, the, the exact thing that is. So you have tau sub ds. So the effect is, again, anticipating the linear change in the error. If you think that the four controls are already enough, you have proportional, you have the special type of proportional, which is on-off, then you have proportional integral and proportional derivative type of control, there is still a modified type of control considering already all three proportional integral and derivative control and as such it is referred to as the proportional integral derivative control it's a combination already of proportional integral and derivative control so now you have the derivative of the error the time derivative of the error and you have the time integral of the error the original proportional control is like this. The transfer function for this PID control will be now this one. The sum actually of the three. This is for the proportional control only. This is for the derivative control, proportional derivative control. And this is for the proportional integral control. A modified and a more accurate type of controller in terms of how well, how well rather it Traits your final control element based on the disturbance in the control variable. Okay, so this is your PID controller transfer function. Output is pressure on the diaphragm of your final control element, which is the valve, and input is the error, the deviation of the sense value from the steady state value. The sense value that we are referring to in here is the temperature of our heat exchanger based on our example the effluent temperature that is now what's the modi uh, the motivation behind why uh, modify from proportional to proportional integral to proportional derivative and now we have PID proportional integral derivative control for the proportional control class, it arrests the rise of the control variable and ultimately brings it to rest to a new steady state value. Offset is the difference in the new steady state value and the original value. What does this mean in layman terms? This simply means that if your, if your control variable has deviated because you have changes in the loads or in the load variable to your system meaning it was affected by the changes in the loads in your system then your new steady state or the ultimate response of your controlled variable to the change in the input will rest on a new steady state value meaning it will never go back to its set value but rather it will have a new steady state value and it will rest there that is if the control is a pure proportional control it will arrest the steady increase or it could be the steady decrease in the value of your control variable we meaning with arrest it will not continue increasing or decreasing but the problem is it will rest on a new steady state value it will not go back to its original steady state value if control is just proportional control what happens to proportional integral control a modification of the original proportional control is this it eliminates the offset meaning your uh, final value 
for your control variable will really be the original steady state value or it will go back to its steady state value in spite of it deviating from it due to changes in the loads. However, class, the response is oscillatory, meaning it will, for some time, it will go up and down. It will oscillate just like what you have seen in sinusoidal response and later on simply die down and rest on the original steady state or set value of your control variable. What is good about proportional integral control is it will go back to the set value or that is it will go back to the original steady state value whereas pure proportional control will not have it go back to the original steady state value. If PI is already good, then why we have PID or why we have PD? So, in the case of proportional integral and derivative control, now all controls are here, considering the time integral of the error and the derivative of the error. What about this? The rise in the controlled value is arrested more quickly and returned to the set value with little or no oscillation. Actually, the PID is a modification of the PI control because it eliminates the oscillation. It will return to the referring to the control variable. It will really return to the steady state value or it's to its original steady state value before the disturbance happen. It will return to it eventually. However, in the case of PI, there will be oscillation. In the case of PID, there is no oscillation if not little, very little oscillation. So that's the very reason why the controllers were modified from the original proportional to proportional integral now to proportional derivative control. So it will ultimately rest on the steady state value before the disturbance happened with little or no oscillation. Now, the textbook by Kauhanor, our textbook by Kauhanor, expounds on this very, very important principle in control in the form of this diagram. So, as you can see here, if there's a particular disturbance, if there's a particular disturbance that is happening on any of the loads in the process, resulting to the change in the value of the controlled variable, if there is no control action, what happens is your controlled variable will increase and would really be uh, extending infinitely here from very different from the steady state value this is the steady state value the original steady state value if there is no control if it's proportional control this is number two this is the graph for number two you can see here it will oscillate and it will rest to a new steady state value it will not go back to this original value which is on the zero value Meaning, if this is zero, there's no deviation from the steady state value. Deviation. This one is the deviation of the control variable from the steady state value. If it's proportional integral control, what happens is there is oscillation. This is number three. There is oscillation, but it will have no offset. It's only two and one that has its own offset. This one is really very difficult because it will extend uh, in a to a very very high value beyond uh, I think the interval or the range of value in which your control variable is to exhibit this is for your proportional integral oscillates but no offset in the case of proportional integral derivative control the oscillation is very small and you see it here it already died down so very little oscillation you see this this is as if you have only initially this oscillation and then it died down no offset very little oscillation if no oscillation at all that's the beauty of proportional integral derivative control now this particular set of slides actually depicted how the transfer function of the final control element which is the control valve came about and it started with the discussion of the schematic diagram of the controller of your control valve or 
of how the electronics function to control your final control valve and ends with the three types of uh, rather specifically there are four types of control for your controller so your controller can function in the four different ways proportional on off proportional integral proportional integral and derivative control and if you're going to add to it the proportional derivative control only okay that's it so i hope you have you can be able to distinguish the difference between the five different types of controller and you know when the transfer function of your controller will change depending on its type and you also know the transfer function of the final control element okay thank you class for listening